Hello and welcome to Doc Clay's Chemistry Lessons. Today we're going to be looking at the AQA A-Level Chemistry course on amino acids, proteins and enzymes. By the end of this lesson then you should be able to do the following. You should be able to identify and name amino acids, explain how amino acids are amphoteric and can act as zwitterions, describe how amino acids can be separated, explain how proteins can form and how they hold their shape, and describe how enzymes function. So the first question then is to say what is an amino acid? Well all amino acids are similar and they all have the same functional groups attached to them and that is in the yellow here they have a carboxylic acid functional group They have an amino group, hence the term amino acids. They all have a common hydrogen bonded to a carbon, and then they all differ by the R group. The R group can be an alkyl chain of varying lengths, and that alkyl chain can also have further carboxylic acids, or alkenes or alcohols on. They simply change by the R group. Let's have a look at naming our amino acids then. The first thing to do is to find the longest carbon chain that also includes the carboxylic acid group. Here then we have two carbon chains in our longest carbon chain group attached to the carboxylic acid and we number the first carbon next to the carboxylic acid number one so this becomes ethanoic acid and we also then have to name the amine group and that is on the second carbon so this is two dash amino ethanoic acid. Let's now have a look at something a little bit more complicated. So this time we've got our longest chain is one, two, three, four. So we're going to have something based on butanoic acid as our longest carbon chain. We've also got here on the one, two, third carbon along. We have a methyl group, so this is 3-methyl butanoic acid. And the final thing to deal with is the amino group again, which is once again on the second carbon. So this is 2-amino-3-methyl butanoic acid. Don't forget to have a look at my nomenclature lessons at the end of this video if you want to double check on how you name any sort of organic substance. The next thing to note about amino acids then is that unless the R group is a hydrogen, then any of the amino acids formed will always be chiral and optically active since the second carbon in the chain will always have an amino group, a carboxylic acid group, a hydrogen and then the R group is going to be an alkyl chain. So when it's not hydrogen all amino acids have got a chiral carbon and are optically active. Amino acids can also form things called zwitter ions. A zwitter ion is a species which is dipolar and it has both a positive and a negative charge. So here we've got three examples and they're all supposed to be the same amino acid. At the middle one here we are at the isoelectric point of the amino acid and that is where the overall charge in the molecule is equal to zero. But in amino acids 
This can happen when we also have a negative charge on the oxygen and a positive charge on the nitrogen. And overall, there's zero charge, but we describe this as a zeta ion. Now, as we said before, amino acids are also amphoteric. And this means they can react with both acids and bases. So if we go to a high pH in this direction, we're going to lose the hydrogen ion because we've got OH minuses, which are going to accept the hydrogen ions. And we end up with a molecule where there is only a negative charge. If we go to a low pH where we've got a excess of hydrogen ions, we gain the proton or the hydrogen ion and we lose our negative charge and we end up with a species which has got NH3 plus on one side and COOH. So at low pH we end up with a positive charge and at high pH we end up with a negative charge. Our final discussion then is to see how we can separate uh, solutions or substances of amino acids and in order to do that we do something called thin layer chromatography. This is different to the paper chromatography that you may have done earlier on in your school career. Instead of using paper, we use a thin layer chromatography plate. And this is normally uh, a plate that's been covered in silica. And I'll go over this in a bit more detail when we look at the practical skills needed for A2 in another video. Importantly, we put the spots of the amino acids on a pencil line at the bottom of the plate and we place the plate into a solvent where the amino acids are above the solvent and we would normally cover this plate. We then measure the distance that the solvent moves called the solvent front and in this case we've labelled that Y and then we measure the distance of each of the amino acids. Importantly, amino acids have no colour and therefore need to be viewed by adding ninhydrin. If you don't want to use ninhydrin, you can also use a fluorescent dye and UV light. The only reason you do these is because the amino acids are invisible and you need something which will bring the color out. Once you've done this you can then measure the distance that the amino acids have moved. Once you've measured the distance you can then calculate the distance traveled by the spot or the amino acid and divide it by the distance traveled by the solvent which is x divided by y in our example here and you'll come up with a value. And this value is determined as the RF or the retention factor. And this retention factor is unique for a given amino acid in a given solvent. And this gives us a way of starting to identify which amino acids we have present. We're going to leave behind our amino acids and use them to see how we can make proteins. So proteins are biological structures and they are simply made from the condensation polymerization between amino acids. We've seen before that condensation means the loss of a small molecule here of water as we have an amino group reacting with a carboxylic acid group and the product from that is an amide link. So in our chemistry terms, we would describe this as an amide link. But if we're talking about the unique situation here of a two amino acids joining together, we're actually going to call this a peptide link. So the peptide link 
refers to the biological condensation of amino acids, while an amide is simply the chemistry term for that functional group. We're now going to have a look at protein structure. And there's three key elements to the protein structure that we need to look at. The primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. The primary structure, then, is simply the sequence of amino acids. Here we've got a picture. We've got leucine, arginine, cysteine, glycine, arginine. Each of these little greens, uh, squares or rectangles, is representing an amino acid. And they have polymerized together to form a polypeptide. And we have, at the end of that, the free carboxylic acid group and the free NH2 group. The order in which they come in can be determined by a numerous factors and all we need to worry about is the primary structure is that sequence of those acids. The secondary structure then, the sequence of amino acids can fold together to form two different types of structure. They are either form the alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. The reason that they form these is that we form hydrogen bonding, which we're going to have a look at in just a moment, between the peptide links, and these form these different types of helices and beta pleated sheets. The final structure then is our tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is further folding and coiling to form a more three-dimensional shape. Again, these occur from intermolecular forces such as hydrogen bonding and as well we will see in a moment that we get disulfide bridges that can form. We'll look at that in more detail in just a moment. Importantly, though, this is the further folding of the secondary structure giving rise to this three-dimensional shape. And the 3D shape, as we'll see in just a little while, is fundamental in things such as enzyme action. Before we go and have a look at enzyme action then, we just need to look at protein structure and the intermolecular forces that cause the three-dimensional shapes that we've just seen of the secondary and tertiary structure. The first, of course, is what we've seen many times before, which is hydrogen bonding, and that's going to occur between the lone pair of electrons that we have on the oxygen in the carbonyl group and the hydrogen next to the nitrogen group but also the uh, nitrogen group will also have a lone pair of electrons with which it can attach to the hydrogen. This is a reasonably strong force of attraction but it's worth noting that this can be affected by both temperature as well as pH changes. The second and new type of intermolecular force that we're going to have a look at here is a disulfide bond. Here we've got an example of cysteine, and you'll notice that against the carbon group in the amino acid, we've got a thiol group. The thiol group is present because of the SH group attached to that alkyl group, and that's on both sides here. As these two things join together, they lose the hydrogen bond, and we end up with a sulfur-sulfur covalent bond occurring between different amino acid chains or polypeptide chains. That interaction is going to affect the shape of our, our protein. Either going to cause it to coil in different tertiary or secondary structures. Key here is that both pH and temperature will have an effect on these intermolecular forces and therefore ultimately the pH will also and temperature will affect the shape of the protein. 
If you've worked in biology before, you've heard of the denaturing of proteins, which is essentially the breaking of these intermolecular forces. In this final section, then, we're going to look at enzymes. They are biological catalysts. So we've seen catalysts in action before. They're going to speed up the rate of a chemical reaction with themselves not being used up. And that's exactly what these do. Enzymes are simply the biological version of these. Any molecule on which an enzyme acts is called a substrate. So the substrate, substrate is simply the molecule being acted upon. And the enzyme is classically a protein, much the way that we've already seen them in the previous section. The key about these are that the enzyme here is what we call stereo specific that means they only work on a specific enantiomer of a substrate so they only work on one enantiomer And that means that they will only react with very specific molecules. We can see here in our diagram, we have the substrate come in. It sits into the active site. It then leaves. A reaction has happened. And here we've got two products coming out the other side. This type of process is often called the lock and key mechanism, whereby the substrate is the key going into the lock and the enzyme being a lock that only fits a specific sort of key. The final thing to look at here then is inhibitors. In this diagram here we can see we've got an inhibitor that fits into the active site of the molecule. It's slightly different to the substrate and perhaps won't be released and therefore once the inhibitor is fitted into the active site the enzyme may no longer work. The reason it may no longer work is because the inhibitor can't be released. Even if it doesn't stop it working, the inhibitor will at least reduce the activity of that enzyme. So medical experts and chemical companies actually make use of this by the fact that some drugs are actually created in such a way to, that they block enzymes from working. by inhibiting the active site. What this does is it stops potential reactions occurring within the body and tricking the body into thinking it's doing something else. That's the end then of the amino acids, proteins and enzymes video. You should now be able to identify and name amino acids, explain how amino acids are amphoteric and can act as vitarines, describe how amino acids can be separated and explain how proteins form and how they hold their shape, and finally describe how enzymes function. In the next video we will look at DNA and how DNA is put together and how certain anti-cancer drugs such as cisplatin work. That's all for now though, I look forward to seeing you soon.